Good evening and thank you for joining us for this Denver 7 Town Hall. We are on the rebound. Part of that means looking ahead, talking schools and your kids tonight. I'm Ann Trujillo. COVID-19, as you know, has changed every aspect of our lives. For parents, kids, educators, daycare workers, the list goes on. So what will fall look like? We are joined by Colorado Education Commissioner Katie Anthes. Colorado Education Association President Amy Baca Olert and Jason Glass, the superintendent of Jefferson Public Schools, Jefferson County Public Schools. First, we're going to start with Dr. Jessica Cataldi, a pediatric infections disease specialist at Children's Hospital Colorado. We want to talk about new cases of MISC in Colorado. So Dr. Cataldi, during Governor Polis's COVID-19 briefing this afternoon, we heard the state epidemiologist and Dr. Dominguez from there at Children's talk about this multi-inflammatory syndrome or MISC related to coronavirus that's impacting kids. So is this cause for concern tonight? Well, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be able to talk with you about this. We know overall that so far COVID-19 has really mostly spared children. And still what we know about COVID-19 is that most kids who get it will have mild illness or may not have any symptoms at all. This new syndrome, uh, this multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children or MISC is very rare, but it is something that we as pediatricians are on the lookout for and we want to make sure that families know about it as well. So I would say that it's very rare and it's not going to impact most children, but it is something that we need to look for because we have treatments that can help. So other than maintaining social distancing practices, is there any special way that we can protect our kids? You know, it's really those social distancing practices and everything else that we have all started to learn about in terms of preventing COVID-19 from spreading person to person. So good hand washing, wearing masks and face coverings when you're out of the house. Um, and if you're sick, staying home. And if you have somebody who's sick at home, being extra careful about having that person washing hands and that person not sharing things like drink, drinking cups and utensils with other people when they're sick, which can be hard. You bet. Okay, so is there anything else parents or teachers should watch for or should know? Um, in general or about this new syndrome? Uh, about that syndrome particularly. Sure, so this syndrome um, is a little different than what we've been seeing for COVID in uh, adults. And so this is a syndrome that we think probably comes maybe after COVID and we're seeing it in communities after we see the peak of COVID cases. The symptoms are fever, usually for a couple of days. And a lot of kids are having bad uh, abdominal pain, sometimes vomiting and diarrhea, as well as rash, red eyes and red lips. So kids with this syndrome, may not have all of those symptoms that I described, but may have one or two. And kids with this syndrome are usually pretty sick. So parents will notice it's not subtle and they should call their pediatricians or bring them into the emergency room to get evaluated if they think that they have this. Dr. Cataldi, thank you for the update on MISC and uh, thankfully it is very rare and we appreciate your insight on that. All right, let's return our focus back to education. The school year is wrapping up this week and next for Colorado students. There are plenty of questions about what the next school year will look like. In fact, a Politico morning consult poll recently found that just over half of Americans think it would be a good idea to return to in-person learning in the fall. About 44% think it would be a bad idea. Either way, it is happening, or at least plans are moving forward. So back to our panel of education officials. So we have around three months before most kids would theoretically be ready to begin a new school year. A lot of ideas and scenarios for what that might look like, depending on the grade. So let me ask you first, right now, is the plan to start on schedule? I'll ask any of you to jump in. Sure, Ann. Well, I'll start. Uh, yes, the plan is to start and, and start this August and try to restore in-person learning as much as possible. I'm decidedly with the yes side of that group, but I understand the concerns of the no side. So I think we've got to commit to trying to restore some kind of in-person learning, but also think about what are the things, every prudent step that we can take, take to keep our schools safe and keep the virus from spreading among our students, our staff, our community, and, and keep our schools from being a vector by which the virus spreads in the community. Well, well, we heard Governor Polis talk about schools using a hybrid model of in-class and at-home learning. Is that your vision, all three of you? Is that what you would like to see as we move forward? Well, I would say uh, as educators, what we would like to see um, is, a, is a return to in-person learning. Of course, that is the 
the best um, scenario for teaching and learning to, to take place is when we can interact face to face. Um, but safety and health need to be paramount. So as Dr. Glass said, um, that will be the top consideration. And if it is a situation where there is an outbreak or it is not safe or healthy to return to in-person learning, then we may need to go to a, a hybrid model. And I think the best thing we can do right now is spend this, these next couple of months working together collaboratively with educators, with our districts, with parents to, um, to create those plans so that everybody knows exactly what, what it, August could August, September, October, November, what that may look like. And Kitty Anthes, is that how you see it as well? Yeah, thanks. I, I fully agree with my colleagues here. Um, at the state level, what we're trying to do, and, and I know districts and, and others are doing this as well, we're trying to plan for multiple scenarios. I completely agree. In-person learning is the best. That's the gold standard. That's what we all hope to get back to. That's what we are striving for at the state level. We're working with the Colorado Department of Public Health to think of all the different safety precautions we can take to get back in-person learning. But we know we're realistic and we have to plan for multiple scenarios. So we are planning for blended learning scenarios, scenarios where we may have to toggle back and forth. Um, and and by, by planning, we can be more prepared next year um, than the abrupt the abruptness that we had to change things this year. And I have to ask, who's part of these conversations? We have heard from teachers who say, have we heard, have, have teachers had input in this conversation about what the fall will look like? Dr. Glass, I'll let you answer that. Sure, thank you. Well, we are one district that is engaging in this as districts all across the state and certainly around the metro region are. There is a group of um, leaders uh, from 16 different school districts around the metro area that meet on a weekly basis to talk about this very challenge and what do we do to solve it. And that includes representation from the uh, uh, Commissioner Anthes and the Department of Education. How we've approached it really is that we wanted to put forth uh, a document or a plan, uh, a draft that represented our best thinking. So we've looked at international systems and how they're approaching this problem, places where the viruses uh, came to a little earlier than it, than it has come to us, other plans that are emerging from systems within the United States, as well as uh, ep plans from uh, doctors, epidemiologists, um, and uh, policy policy thinkers around things that we should be considering and thinking about when we reopen school. We've released that to our school leaders and gotten their feedback. It's currently in the hands of all of our staff, including our teachers to get their feedback. And then on Friday, we'll release it to the whole community and really the whole um, uh, world at that point, seeking feedback to make sure that we've thought through everything, that we haven't missed something, and that there aren't some creative ideas that we could be applying to solve this problem. We're committed to restoring some kind of in-person learning, but we have to think about what public health standards and hygiene practices can we put in place to make sure that that experience is safe. Well, sure. And we've heard from parents. And as you all know, we all know this is this is a rough time on parents to be able to to teach their kids from home. So we heard from Lindsay, a viewer. She sent us a question that we've heard from a lot of parents when they hear about plans for part time, potential part time remote learning. And she writes, if kids aren't allowed to go back to school full time and both parents have to work out of the house full time, is the school district then going to pay for my full time nanny homeschool teacher while his parents have to work? to continue to provide for our families. How are you taking all of this into account? Well, I, my response to that, we're gonna do better than that. We're gonna provide you with a full-time uh, trained, talented, engaged educator who's gonna deliver an education to your to your student. Um, and I, But I understand the concern behind this question. Uh, we know that uh, the schools serve a, a childcare function uh, for society. And part of the economic drag that we're feeling as a nation and as a state is from uh, our uh, our workforce being disrupted because because we've created all these childcare issues for people. So again, we want to get back to in-person learning to the greatest extent possible because we know that'll help help unleash the engine of our economy all that much more. All right, we have a question that was phoned in by Christine. She is a health screener for Denver Public Schools. Let's listen. I was just wondering if uh, the children, the students will be screened uh, for their temperature as they all go back to school in the, the fall. Dr. An or excuse me, Commissioner Anthes, what do you think? Yeah, um, that's certainly uh, something that is on the list. We, we are working on guidance very similarly to um, Dr. Glass 
and in that we will be putting a toolkit together for our districts to think about all of these different pieces. We're working on that with the Department of Public Health. Screening is certainly a part of that. We think that that's gonna be really important um, as we move forward. And, and temperature is just one, one element of that, but we wanna, we really want to be aware and have our eyes open uh, for any, anyone who might be symptomatic so that we can nip that in the bud very quickly and um, resume back to safety. And as we think about going back to school, I mean, we're talking about a lot of tasks here. Amy baca Oler, do you concern that that will be another job put on teachers? Well, I think this is why teachers are so um, adamant, and all educators, adamant about being included in these discussions and these decisions. Um, nobody knows better than the classroom teacher, than the bus driver, than the food service worker, um, how these things will impact their professional um, life. And so that is why their, um, their voices need to be included in these conversations. I think teachers are um, extremely concerned about um, all of these decisions and what that may mean for their work life um, and for their home life. Many educators are parents themselves and so they have to think about and they have been trying to balance this um, work teaching at home and teaching your own children at the same time. And so um, we ask a lot of our educators. I think this um, crisis has shown the world just how dedicated and committed educators are to serving children, to making sure that every child learns. Um, and so we need to include in these conversations what that means. And, and we welcome the opportunities like Dr. Glass pointed out to, to engage in those um, conversations, to look at those draft plans that have been put together and provide feedback about what this will actually mean when it hits the, when it hits the school building. I gotta tell you though, I'm, I'm getting a bunch of text messages. These are messages from viewers. And uh, there are some parents who say their kids haven't really learned much. Um, really learn nothing from, from home over these last couple of months. What do you all say to that? Well, um, you know, what I would say is, is we know that this is not an ideal situation. This was a situation that we had to go to very quickly um, due to this crisis um, situation. And so we want to get back to, to in-person learning. Um, I'm a mom of three. I have an 11-year-old, a nine-year-old, and a seven-year-old at home. And I, I, all three of them have amazing teachers who are doing amazing things, but it certainly is not the same as being in person in the classroom. Um, and so that is why I think we all, um, all of us on this call, all educators across the state are committed to digging in, to figuring out what we can do if we have to go to this type of environment again. Of course, our best case scenario is that we are back in our school buildings, back in our classrooms, um, so that we can optimize learning. We know that many students have been disproportionately disadvantaged in this situation. They've had extreme barriers to access, such as lack of technology, um, lack of internet, and, and also just home circumstances that have prevented them from engaging in the way that some other students have. So it is certainly something that we all need to be discussing and, and figuring out how we can ensure all students have access to learning um, no matter their zip code, where they live, or what their home circumstance may be. And we know budgets are going to be an issue as we head back to school in the fall. So we're going to talk about that after we take this short break. And welcome back to this Denver 7 special Rebound Town Hall on education. We know state lawmakers met today to go over the K through 12 budget. They called for higher ed cuts yesterday. At the same time, the governor allocated some of the CARES Act funds to K through 12. So what's your assessment right now about funding for the school year? Katie Anthes, I'll let you take that. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Well, we did. Uh, I mean, there's there's no sugarcoating it. The state budget is is not looking good. Um, the education sector represents about 35% of the state budget. So we know that, uh, you know, that education is a place where they they may have to cut and, and the Joint Budget Committee is making those decisions and talking about that this week. So we know that there's bad news to come. You know, we had a little bit of good news this week and that the governor um, did, did allocate some dollars um, from the Federal CARES Relief Act um, to schools. And so that money has, 
is going out to schools this week, which can help them respond to the immediate needs um, based on the um, COVID situation, such as uh, digital needs, devices, Wi-Fi, those sorts of things. But we we know that our districts will have um, you know future needs uh, beyond this relief fund, and so so we know that there are challenges ahead. So yes, it does sound like there's going to be some juggling ahead. So Dr. Glass, will well, do you see districts cutting jobs? If so, which jobs go first? I think it's going to depend on each district. Uh, as Commissioner Anthony said, the governor's actions this week have been a game changer in terms of what we were planning for and modeling for um, ne next next school year. Uh, we went from planning for over 12%, possibly up to 16% reductions in funding um, from our current level. And now because of the CARES Act infusion of dollars, we're now looking at 5% um, reductions, which is still less than we had before. So we've got to control costs. Uh, Jeffco Public Schools is also a district over years that has built up uh, a healthy cash reserve. So we're going to use that to cushion some of this blow. Um, so we're, I think we're going to be okay uh, for next year. I think we're going to be able to hang on to jobs and take care of our people and deliver a quality educational experience for our kid. I'm more concerned about what happens the year after that and the year after that. We know from these recessions in Colorado that we end up with multi-year effects. And so what happens the year after this coming one probably is going to be a lot harder than what we have to do with right now because the CARES Act uh, federal money may not be there to, to support us again and we will have started to deplete those district cash reserves. And we have a parent who asks, what about those of us who have kids with special needs? What accommodations are being made for special needs kids? Yeah, well, we're really thinking about that. I know our districts are too. Um, you know, we, we are gonna need to think really creatively. Obviously that has been uh, more difficult as we had to turn uh, this whole system into remote learning in some way, shape or form. Uh, but for next year, we're, again, gold standard is we're hoping we're back in school and we can support those students um, with special needs, um, as we always have, and give them some special and, and intensive attention uh, for any learning gaps. Um, but we also know that, you know, we can think creatively next year if we do have to do partial, you know, remote learning or partial blended learning, that we may need to prioritize some students if we have smaller groups of learning, we may need to prioritize certain students that, that really need that in-person learning and, and allow them to come into the building first. All right, let's talk about masks for a moment because Charmaine wants to know about them. If kids return to school and masks are required, will they be? I don't know. How would it be handled if, say, kids refuse to wear one or can due to medical reasons? This is a question that across the world, there is no consensus on. So we, again, looked at international systems and uh, what their approaches have been. Some of them are requiring masks, some are not. It really, uh, the question should be, what is, this, what is the entire system of uh, safety checks and public health checks that we can put in place to make school a safe place? So things like symptom screening and temperature checks when students come into a building, uh, things like changing um, interaction patterns so we have fewer students that are gathered in one place together or that are moving back and forth in the hallway, um, uh, things like uh, a protective equipment for some of our employees or some students that may have an underlying comorbidity or, or potential health risk. And eventually we, we'd love to see the availability of widespread testing uh, so we could tell where this virus is and, and then do um, a track contact tracking from there. So we really got to look at the entirety of, of what, it, what model is being put in place to try and protect the health of, the, of those in the school. So will that be for all the, our school districts in Colorado then, or will that be a, a pick and choose situation for our districts as to what kind of safety precautions they'll be taking in the classroom? Yeah, thanks, Ann. I'll try that. You know, we're, we are going to have to wait and see how, um, how the virus plays out in Colorado over the next couple of months before we're going to be able to make some concrete decisions about what will be a health requirement versus what will be guidance. You know, we're hoping that we can have the testing and the knowledge of where the vi virus is so that there can be more flexibility by community and by region in our state. Um, but right now, we, we really are going to have to be a little bit patient and see how the virus plays out in Colorado and then see what that will say for the health requirements 
um, that may be across the state or may just be in certain communities um, if the virus uh, load is higher in those communities. So we, we do think those will have to play out. Okay, so we do have another question that was phoned in. This woman didn't leave her name, but she has a question or better yet an idea about ventilation in schools. Have a listen. Will the schools, if they open, will they um, reverse ventilation in the building? Reversing ventilation in the in the building, in the classroom. Does that does that mean anything to, to any of you? Is that an idea worth considering? Yeah, it does uh, to us. Uh, so what I think she's referring to is the mixture of sort of recirculated air versus fresh air in buildings. And um, depending on the configuration and age of the building and the, the HVAC system that's installed, um, schools and the district does have the ability to change the mixture of recirculated air and fresh air. And so uh, we will maximize the, the fresh air that we bring into buildings. And while the weather's good, we'll open, open windows and doors and try to keep ventilation moving. So I think it's, a, it's an excellent point in question and, and another one of those things that we have to layer in that we're doing in a building to try and maximize the safety. All right, Shannon. Has and, a oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to add, you know, I mean, one of the things to, to consider is all of these, um, all of these questions are just so complex. There's not just a simple um, way to answer any of that. Of course, when we even, even when we think about things such as opening doors and windows, you have to think of secondary safety concerns that come with that. Um, we as school districts, unfortunately, in Colorado, we've had to put a lot of thought into safety of our schools. And there's been a lot of thought put into um, doors being locked and access to buildings. And so when we think about just sometimes things seem very simple, like we'll just um, think about how we ventilate the schools. It's a very complex um, solution. And so it, that's why it requires all this time and all this planning. Um, and even something like the masks, it's not just about will kids wear them or not, they can impact teaching and learning. Some of our earliest learners, um, they need to see their teacher's mouth. That's one of the, the ways that the, the teacher teaches them and the teacher needs to see their mouth so they can see if they're getting those sounds just right. So there's so many complex considerations to all of these questions that we're, that we're having to contemplate right now. Those are good points. Uh, all right, Shannon has a question about teachers who do not feel safe to return to the classroom writing. Should those teachers who do not want to risk the return to the classroom be given a paid leave of absence, make a temporary career change, take a sabbatical, uh, be allowed to transfer? What do you all think? Well, I can tell you how we're considering it. This is a real issue, especially for um, teachers who may have a comorbidity or an underlying health risk where them being in school uh, puts puts potentially their life at risk. We know that we're going to have some students who want a remote or only environment, and and we are likely to have a number of teachers who want to teach only in a remote only environment. So, the first step is to see can we match that up? Can we make the numbers numbers work? Um, if if those are imbalanced, we're going to have to look at can we provide uh, leaves for people so that they can take a year off and let this pass. Perhaps come back when there's a vaccine available. Uh, in our district, I don't see where we'll be able to pay some. Someone, uh, to be on leave for that whole period of time. We're, we're already lean and, and we're hitting a budget cut year. So I, I know this is a really uh, difficult thing to talk about, but we're going we're gonna to do our best to try and match up the students who want remote learning and the teachers who want remote learning. And for the, where there is no match and we can't make that work, we can provide that, that year leave, uh, unpaid leave. All right. I got to tell you all, we only have about two minutes left. So let me ask you very quickly. Someone wants to know, should graduation requirements change at all because of the lost learning? You know, we're, we are going to be thinking about that. We're going to be thinking about a lot of policies at the state level moving forward. Uh, you know, we have uh, several policy making bodies that are debating those things, the legislature, the State Board of Education, um, and, and the governor. So, so those are all things that are on the table, but we really do need to see how this plays out. And I think our school districts have done a wonderful job in these last several months of, of of finding ways to learn and finding new new learning and supporting our current graduates. Okay, let me ask you this. What about changes in sports? What can be shared about that so far? There's a lot that we don't know. Uh, I think we should we should continue to wait and see uh, what best practices emerge again from other countries. Uh, what uh, we see professional sports teams, college sports teams start to do uh, individual sports are probably going to move forward. We may have to think about how we how we might restrict or make safer uh, team sports. But I think right now there's just a lot that we don't know. How are we going to handle 
let's say, buses? Will buses be running? I mean, is that a, a safe social setting? What about lunch, lunchtime activities? Yeah, you're talking about the layers of operational decisions that we have to really process through. In every one of those situations, you've got to think about what can we do to make this a safe environment for the student and not create a vector by which the virus spreads in the community. So buses, how, how, how food is served, all of those things have to be considered and redesigned. All right. Um, I think that uh, I think that we are we are. I just want to say thank you so much to the three of you for spending time with us. I know there's a lot to to filter through, a lot of still unanswered questions out there. But I just want to thank you so much for joining us for this special Rebound Town Hall on education. Uh, we hope for those of you at home watching that it answered at least some of your questions because we know this is an early conversation, but there's so much to figure out as we have learned from our three guests. So. If you have more questions, send them to us at contact7 at thedenverchannel.com. Hopefully we can find an answer for you. And uh, I'm Andrew Heal. I will see you back here later on tonight for Denver 7 News at 10 o'clock.